We move on to the second to last chapter. The second to last chapter of my little talk here. The resurrection of Islam amongst African Americans. Now, we all know about the nation of Islam and, and, and the, 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 the role that it's played in introducing Islam to African Americans. The nation of Islam was initially started by a person by the name of Wallace D. Fard. Wallace Muhammad, Ay Warith Muhammad of our times was named after Wallace D. Fard. Wallace D. Fard. This Wallace D. Fard, he was a clothing salesman. He traveled door to door in a predominantly black neighborhood of what is now Detroit, Michigan in the 1930s. Much has been theorized about Wallace D. Fard. Who was he? Where did he get his ideas from? However, one thing is known for sure. In 1920, 10 years before Fard, the first Qadiyani Muslim arrived in America. Dr. Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. Indian origin, Qadiyani, all you know Qadiyanis, heretic group, we don't consider them to be Muslims. They believe in Mirza Ghulam Ahmad to be a prophet after the Prophet ﷺ. He arrived in America to start spreading teachings of Qadianism. And he began writing pamphlets, letters, brochures, converting a lot of people to Qadianism, not to Islam. And he moved later to Chicago, where he founded the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Chicago. And it is no coincidence that the Nation of Islam's foundation and base also has a lot to do with Chicago. One of the people that he drew into his group, we're talking about Dr. Sadiq, the Indian, was an African American by the name of Timothy Drew, who, who became, who called himself Noble Drew Ali. And he went on to found the first uniquely African American quasi-Islamic group, the Moorish Science Temple of North America. This was an up and running religion for many decades. It still exists, I think there's still a temple somewhere in New Jersey, but it is now completely a defunct organization. He founded the first, if you like, inherently uh, American Islamic experience. Obviously for us looking at it now, and there's no doubt about it, it is kufr, there's no, nothing Islamic about it except a few names. And he has a book called the Quran, and he is from Mecca, and he's this and that. But the religion has nothing to do with Islam. But the idea has started. We need to form a new theology for the African Americans. Moving back to Wallace D. Fard. Wallace D. Fard began preaching a new theology. When the Qadianis are in the background, they're already here, they're up and running. Wallace D. Fard comes along. And he claims to have been born in Mecca, that he was taught that the white race had been uh, a scientific experiment you know, that was created by the black race, by an evil scientist by the name of Yaqub, etc, etc. The same, now this theology is still the theology of the nation of Islam. Where did this guy get this from? Who is he? Wallace D. Fard. What are his origins? To this day, we don't know for sure. But recently there was a very good book written uh, about the various Islamic movements and I, I read it cover to cover, it was very fascinating. Uh, and there's actually a picture of Wallace D. Fard because he was arrested twice for petty charges. So the, the, the police actually took a picture of him. We have a picture of him, it's actually available even online. And this researcher, very convincingly in my opinion, concluded that this person, Wallace D. Fard, he's actually from New Zealand, born to an Indian Qadiani, quote-unquote Muslim father, and a New Zealand mother. So his father is an Indian Qadiani. And his mother is Caucasian, white, New Zealand. And he came to America as an immigrant to work to get some money. And his features were neither white nor black. He's definitely not African American, but he's definitely not white either. If you look at his picture still, it's obvious. It's, it's something unique, ethnically different. And this explains it, that he's half Indian and half Caucasian. And this Qadiani, or so we think he's Qadiani, what proves he was Qadiani, by the way, as well, is that he would be seen worshipping in the Qadiani center of Chicago. He would go to the Qadiani masjid of Chicago. That was already up and running by the, uh, the, the Indian da'i that had been sent. This Qadiani began preaching this new teachings of prophethood and new prophets and new this and that. So Wallace D. Fard is the one who formed a basic vision. And one of his primary students, one of his primary students was... Elijah Poole, later to become Elijah Muhammad, the founder of the Nation of Islam. 
So Elijah Poole became attracted to him. Elijah Poole has a very uh, interesting story as well, drug addict and, and, and alcoholic, whatnot. His wife cleaned him up. His wife literally forced him to attend the, the lectures of this person, Wallace Defard, leave all of this stuff, get a job, this and that. So literally, Wallace Defard cleaned him out, made him a new person, transformed him. He owed his entire existence now to Wallace Defard. And Wallace Defard mysteriously disappears. We don't know what happened. Most likely, it's a very innocent thing. He was arrested a second time. And he was said he'd have to be deported, so he was deported back to New Zealand. But the last thing that he said in jail to Fard who had come to visit him, you're in charge. I can't do anything, I'm leaving. You're in charge of whatever I've started. So it was Elijah Poole who changed his name to Elijah Muhammad, who then even took this theology to a new level. Elijah Poole, Elijah Muhammad was the first person to say, Wallace D. Fard is God himself. He never said that. Wallace D. Fard, he was a Qadiani, he's quite messed up, but he's not that messed up, okay? He's, he, he never claimed to be God. Elijah Muhammad said, this was God who had come. And obviously, if he's God, and I spoke with him, what does that make Elijah Muhammad? The Prophet of God. So I am the Prophet, Elijah Muhammad says, I am the Prophet, and Fard, Wallace D. Fard is the God who came down. Allah Himself came down to earth. And... The theology is the same, black man is this, white man is that. And then he developed his own thinking, what not. And the rest, as you know, is indeed history. But the nation of Islam spread a pseudo-Islamic theology amongst African Americans. And you have to realize, and this is something I want to say very bluntly. I am an Aqidah teacher. I know Aqidah. I know Kufr. I know this is Kufr. But we also have to understand that sometimes Kufr leads to a good at the end. We're not justifying the kufr. It is kufr. But were it not for this perverted teaching of Islam, you wouldn't have the large segment of African American Muslims that we do. This pseudo-Islamic teachings actually made them enter into pseudo-Islam and then in the 60s, 70s, 80s, alhamdulillah, the majority of them entered into Orthodox Islam. If this pseudo-Islam had not existed, they would not have been Orthodox Muslim. I'm not justifying it, I'm just stating a historical reality. And that is something we need to understand. Elijah Muhammad, as you know, uh, he never really changed his theology. Uh, famous people converted, obviously the most famous, Muhammad Ali, who is still uh, alive today. This person is a living legend in every sense of the term, including for the history of Islam in America. He made the name Muhammad a household name. That's a very positive thing. Okay, every household in America now knows the name Muhammad because of Muhammad Ali. Uh, this is a very positive thing. Okay, other famous converts, as you all know, Malcolm X, Karim Abdul Jabbar, they all converted to the nation of Islam. Eventually, all of them left it to orthodoxy. Elijah Muhammad sent some of his sons to Azhar. He had plenty of sons, legitimate and illegitimate, as we all know. He sends his sons to Azhar. His son, the oldest one, I forgot his name now. Um, does anybody remember his name? Herbert, the oldest one. When he studies at Azhar, Akbar, sorry, it's Akbar. It's not Herbert, it's Akbar. Akbar went to Azhar. And when he studies with Muslims, all of a sudden he realizes, something's wrong with my father's teachings. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And so Akbar comes back and he starts giving some hints and indications. This is not Islam, what we, what we believe in. This is not Islam. And bit by bit, Orthodox Islam comes in and in and in. And Wadithin Muhammad, the present leader of uh, the, most of the African American brothers of ours, Wadithin Muhammad was one of those people who opposed his own father. And at the death of his father in 1975, within three years, he had disbanded the NOI, abolished it, and said there is no prophet after the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. there is no theology of blacks being created by whites, etc. All of this is abolished. I want to say again something very blunt. It's going to get me into trouble, but it needs to be said. Many of us immigrant second generation Muslims, we really and truly look down at some of these people. We criticize them in their theological positions. Sometimes with merit. Sometimes with merit. Yes, it is true. Some of what certain people say is wrong from a pure orthodoxy. But we need to see what Wadatin Muhammad did. He took his people out of blatant kufr. And he entered them into Islam. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Even if we disagree, I disagree with some of the minutiae, some of which are not minutiae, some of them are major things of fiqh, major things of methodology. I disagree with Wadidin Muhammad in certain things, but I respect and admire what he's done. The courage that he must have had 
to stand up and oppose the teachings of his own father, to divert his people from some perverted version of Islam to some orthodox version. Some orthodox. It might not be as orthodox as we would like it to be. Some of us here. True. Agreed. But it is still Islam, alhamdulillah. It believes in the same pillars. Worships Allah, not Fard Muhammad. Prays Mecca, fast in Ramadan, and not in December. These are changes that Wadithin Muhammad brought about. I think we immigrants need to get over this mentality of being so overly critical of people without realizing where they came from, what they did. And that's something that needs to be said. It's time has come for us to talk so boldly and so bluntly about these issues. We need to ta tackle these issues head on and say, yes, I respectfully disagree with some of the teachings of some of the people involved with the movement of Wadithin, but I still give him a lot of credit and respect. Immense credit and respect. The fact that where he was and where he is now, that is something we Muslims need to appreciate and understand. So, of course, the best book on this, the single best book on this, there's no, no holds barred, is the book by a leading African-American intellectual. All of you should be familiar with him. Dr. Abdul Hakim Jackson, Dr. Sherman Jackson. Uh, he has written a book, Islam and the Third Resurrection. Um, sorry. Islam and the Black American, the Third Resurrection. Uh, that's something that definitely you should read as well. It's a very fascinating book uh, by Dr. Abdul Hakim Jackson.